Well, good morning, Northland. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Will you give it up for all of our moms? What a, what a special moment we had. Thank you, Lori, for, for that. Well, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 27. We are getting ready to complete the book of Acts. We started in 2022. Uh, we will be ending next week. And so we actually started the book of Acts before I even became the pastor of Northland. Pastor Gus started it, and so we are getting ready to, like I said, uh, finish it. And I've really, really enjoyed walking through the book of Acts with you. The last several weeks have been very challenging for me. I think this week and even next week are challenging as well. Like I'm very convicted, as you will see later on in the message. And so as I was thinking about where we're going this weekend, I was starting to think about the, the word theater. Everybody say theater. Now, coming from the South, uh, I'm not very cultured when it comes to plays or the theater. And I, I don't know why that is. I'm sure it's not a Southern thing. I'm sure that there are definitely Southerners out there. They like the plays. They like the theater. And just so that you know, I'm not talking about the movie theater. I'm talking about the other theater where you go and see plays. All right. So that's where I'm like, I'm not really that cultured. And I, I don't know if it's because I just don't understand what's going on in a play. Like now, I, I, I don't know about you, but I actually watch TV in subtitles. Anybody else out there, you watch TV in subtitles? Okay. Years, years ago, Joni's like, why are you doing that? And now she watches TV in subtitles. And so it's glorious. But when I go and watch a play and there's no subtitles, I'm like, what are they saying? I, I don't know what's going on. And so like in Hamilton, I, I, you know, I love the music, but I don't understand the lyrics. And I actually fell asleep in Hamilton a couple of years ago. And Jonah's like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's past my bedtime. And so I, I don't know if it's that. I don't know if it's subtitles. Don't know what it is, but I'm not the biggest theater play guy. I, I'll go and support my family, but it's just not something that really floats my boat. But whenever I think about the word theater, or theater, I think about the movie White Christmas, and I'm going to play the clip. I'm just going to show the little scene there where he goes, theater, theater, what happened to the theater? And I don't have, that has nothing to do with the message other than theater. So uh, I thought you might get a little glimpse into how my mind works sometimes. But life is a theater. Life is the stage on which the theater, the play happens. You know how I know? Because this is what William Shakespeare said. All the world's a stage. And all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven Stages, And so if you know anything about that play, and again, I didn't know very much about plays growing up. And sure, I, I read about and read William Shakespeare when I was in high school, but man, I didn't even really understand that. But here's what I do understand about that particular quote. And then having done a little bit more research this past week is he then unfolds the seven stages of life from birth until death. And I think actually William Shakespeare is on to something that life is a stage. Life is a theater in which your life is being played out. But here's what we know about life being a stage for the theater, the play to be played out is that it's more improv than anything else. Like no one's handing you the script and handing you the lines and saying, hey, here, read this, act this out. And so when I think about more improv theater, I actually think about this show. Anybody seen this show, Whose Line Is It Anyways? I love that show. If I wasn't a pastor, I'd be in improv. Like, I, I love it because there are times where I go off script here. There's times where in Extra Takes, which is our podcast, I don't even have a script and I go off that. Like, I love improv. But really life, if life is a stage and if life is a theater, it is more improv than anything else. So let me, you know, so let, let me ask you, all right, like when, when you think about life being a stage and, and a theater, like what are you producing? Well, what are you living out? So here's the main point that we're going to get at, that life is the stage for your faith to be on display. Now, last week we looked at life being a trial that you are depicting what you believe is just 
or justice by the way you live out your life. But I want you to understand that life is not only a trial by which you are depicting what you believe is just and justice, but life is a stage for our faith to be on display. And I want you to realize that every single one of us, we have faith in something or someone. Sure, I would say that the, the, the majority here, you have what we would call Christian faith, that your faith, your trust in, your confidence in, your belief in is in Jesus. And your faith in Jesus impacts or should impact and influence every area of your life. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, then your faith is in something So what is your faith in? Because life is a stage in which your faith is on display. And so in the words of Joey Tribbiani from Friends, uh, hey, how you doing? Like, like how, how you doing in your faith? Well, what is your faith proclaiming? What is your faith projecting? What is your faith doing? How is your faith responding to the various elements that come in your life? That's what we will see with the Apostle Paul, is that as he is on his way to Rome to stay in trial, you're going to see three particular things. You're going to see elements that come into his life, how he responds to those elements, and then the outcomes that he experiences as a result of his responses to the elements. And I want you to see that this is more of an improvisational theater where things are happening. He, he, doesn't, he, he, do, he doesn't have a script, but he is responding to what's coming in his life. And we're seeing how God brings about the outcome of his responses to the elements. And here's what I hope and pray is that we will all be challenged. I hope and pray not only will we all be challenged, but some of you, you would actually check your faith to even say, do I have true saving faith? Do I have a faith that really goes this distance? Do I have a faith that would respond like this? So I want your faith to be challenged. I want your faith for some of you to be checked. And then maybe for a handful of you, your faith needs to be changed because you're just like, man, I ain't got faith like that. And that's what we will see with the apostle Paul. So let's pray and we will dive in. So father, I pray that you be glorified. Jesus, I pray that you would be the center of this message, you would be the center of our lives. Spirit, I pray that you would go to work ministering among us, drawing us, giving us insight, finding ways that the truth of your word impacts and influences and transforms us. And I pray that we will leave different than when we came as a result of your work among us. For it's in your name we pray, our King. All God's people said... Amen. All right, so let's look at the first column. The first column is elements we all face. We all will face these elements. You're going to face sea and seasons, sea captains, storm soldiers, shipwrecks, and snake bites. You're like, man, what kind of list is that? Well, let, let's look at it one after the other. So let's look at sea and seasons. Now remember, Paul's on his way to Rome. And so we, we see that the next day they landed at Sidon, so they're, they're in a boat. Uh, Julius is the centurion. He is really in charge of the boat. And Julius showed kindness to Paul. He's going to allow him to go and spend some uh, time with his friends so his friends can meet his needs. From there, we put out to sea again and pass to the Lee of Cyprus. Now, that's more of a nautical term. Not really going to pay attention to the nautical terms here, but that, that's a nautical term because the winds were against us. I want, you to, I want you to think about that, winds being against them, because I know that there's seasons in our life where we feel like things are against us. Now we, we see that there was a, the centurion found an Alexandrian uh, ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off of Sindus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete opposite of Salmon. Then let's read what else happens. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens. Now much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement, which was around late September, early October. And here's what you did not want to do. 
you did not want to set sail in late September, early October, because that was when tumultuous storms would come about on the Mediterranean Sea. It was like living in Florida between July and November. What kind of season is that? Hurricane season. Well, this is hurricane season. This is typhoon season. You don't want to be on the seas during that time. But what we see early on, there was already difficulty. What we see early on, there were already headwinds that they were dealing with. See, I really want you to understand is that the natural ebb and flow of life will contain difficulties. The natural ebb and flow of life will contain those headwinds. The natural ebb and flow of life will involve chaos and disorder where you feel like you are drudging through life. Anybody ever been there? Like you're just living, you're like, Lord have mercy, life, I thought life was easier. See, here's what I know, because I've already preached this twice, is I have all of the older aged uh, kingdom saints, the oaks, they come up to me like, man, listen, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. The younger people, not so much, but let me, I think all of our older aged kingdom saints, I think you would agree, life isn't easy. And so there's going to be ebb and flows of your life where, yeah, sure, things are clicking. You feel like you got the tailwind of God behind you. But then there are a lot of seasons where you're like, oh, my gosh, I feel like nothing is happening. Nothing is going my way. That's what we see with the Apostle Paul, those people on the ship. Things are just really hard. Now, let me tell you what, what seasons of life that you can expect these kinds of difficulties and hardships is seasons of transition transition. Like, so some of you, you are new parents. That is a transitional season. Sure. When, when the baby comes out, you're like, Oh my gosh, you're so cute. I've been wanting a baby forever. And then that baby won't go to sleep. <laughs> and then you're like, I'm so tired. Oh my gosh. You know, it's like, I get it, but it's a transition. Also, one of the things that we're experiencing in the Laxon household is really this transition of really all of our kids being teenagers. So Luke is about to turn 13, and then we will have an 18, 16, and 13-year-old. And I tell you, we love our children, absolutely love our children. Teenagers are really, really hard. I mean, there's one time where, I mean, you're like, you feel like your best friends, that the world, I mean, is just, just glorious. And then the next minute, you hear screaming, and you're like, what happened? Because it's just like, you know, big, this big knockout, dragout argument. And so that, that's a transition. Sometimes when we are in corporations and organizations that go through transitions, I mean, there, there's a lot of difficulty because of that transition because change is happening. And so what we see here is that there's this season of transition on the waters and it is making life difficult for this ship. But not only are they dealing with sea and seasons, but they're also dealing with sea captains and sailors. So, but the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, and you can probably estimate what Paul said, he's like, hey, we need to stop and we'll see that here in a second. But the centurion didn't listen to what Paul said. He followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. So since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. Well, could you imagine that the sea captain and the sailors, they're going to be wrong. They should have just stopped, but they didn't. So there's going to be seasons and moments in our life where we're going to have these sea captains and sailors that won't listen to us. And these are people in authority who's going to lead us in a direction that we know we should not be going. This could be parents. This could be teachers and coaches. This could be bosses and supervisors. Yes, it can be even governmental officials. Like I know what some of you are thinking, I didn't vote for them, but I I told you this is the way that they're going to lead us. (laughs) And then these sea captain and sailors can represent people who think they know better. Like you, you, you've shared with them, and so this could be children. I mean, how many times are we trying to, parents, give our children wise counsel, good, sound advice? Listen, we can, we, we can give them wise counsel, sound advice until we're blue in the face, but they may not receive it. 
This could be family and friends that, that you're, you're telling them, but they just think they know better. Staff, coworkers, the culture and world. So there, there's gonna be times where, we've, where we are faced with these sea captains and sailors when we're trying to tell them something that is wise, something that is good, but they're going to reject it. And they might, be, because of the situation, they might be in charge and lead us in a direction where we know we should not be going. Well, that is the apostle Paul. And then the third thing that he is going to encounter, element, uh, storms. Now, before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and we were driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. Now, you know the reason why they're throwing cargo overboard is now there's probably a leak in the boat. They got to make the ship lighter. And then here's what we read. When neither, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of what? Being saved. So not only uh, did Paul encounter a sea or season that was extremely difficult, not only did he encounter an element of a sea captain and sailors not listening to him, but he also encountered this storm. The ship encountered this storm where they have lost complete control now of the ship. Like they they cannot sail out of it. They cannot row out of it. uh, They cannot escape it. They are stuck in it. They are at the mercy of this storm. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been at the mercy of a storm in your life? Like you had no control over it. You had no authority over it. You are now stuck in this storm and you are holding on to dear life. But did you also see this? They had no clue where they were at. So the storm was so bad, they couldn't see the sun, the moon, the stars. They didn't know which way was north or south. It's not like they could say, hey, Siri, where are we? I mean, like they couldn't do that. So they have no idea where that, have you ever been in a storm that bad in your life where you couldn't, you you could not tell head from tails, north from south, and you are just now floating along. What kind of life storms do these depict Josh well loss like the whole idea of a loss is that you couldn't stop the loss and again I I don't know what you lost maybe you lost a job maybe you lost someone that you love maybe you lost money something happened and you lost it and now it brought about this storm that you could not control and then that loss turns to grief you know that you cannot here's the thing I hope you realize this you and I we cannot control grief now, we, we can control us processing grief, but we cannot control grief. And grief is produced by loss. And there's some of you maybe here engaging online, you are fighting for your marriage and you cannot control your spouse and how they're fighting. And, and so here's the thing, you, you feel like you have lost control and you're holding on for dear, you are fighting for survival. That, that could also be with a wayward child. You're fighting for survival, just maintaining a relationship. And so when you are in this storm, I know things are going through your mind. I I could imagine what might have been going through the Apostle Paul's mind. But as you're in this storm, you're probably thinking, well, I think this could have been prevented. But here's the thing, that ain't gonna help you out. Then you could be thinking, well, who's to blame? Listen, that ain't helping you out in the storm for you to see what could have happened or who to blame. No, you're just holding on for dear life. So you got sea seasons, you got sea captains, you got storms. But then I want us to see that there's soldiers too that you got to deal with. So when daylight came, they saw a bay with the sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. Oh, now think about this. All right, so the soldiers are like, well, we're we're getting ready to have to abandon ship. What if one of these prisoners swim away? And if they swim away, then we will be responsible for their life. And as a result, we will be killed because they got away. So the soldiers are like, let's just 
do the easy thing. Let's kill all the prisoners and we'll be safe. Now, again, I'm, not, I'm actually not going to fault them for this. I know we're looking at it and go, well, that's pretty harsh. Listen, it's either the prisoners who have done something bad or the soldiers. And so they're just doing their job. Listen, come, come in for this. There are times where we will get caught in the crosshairs of people just doing their job. And we're at their mercy. I, I remember uh, this past week, I was dealing with the situation that is about a year and a half old and I didn't even know, like they, somebody sent an email. And so I called and they could not give me a good answer. So when they could not give me a good answer, I was a little forceful with them in Jesus name. <laughs> Just a little. So I was trying to have that kind of stern voice that was both truthful and gracious. What does that sound like? You hear it every week, you hear it every week. Anyway, so, and so I was telling Joni, I was telling Joni about this and she's like, why are you giving that lady a hard time? She's just doing her job. job. Listen, there are sometimes we just get caught in the crosshairs of people doing their job. And we find ourselves at the mercy of a corporation facing layoffs. We might find ourselves at the mercy of an economy that has high inflation. We might be at the mercy of a school only having a certain number of spots they can give away. We might be at the mercy of a insurance company that doesn't cover that prescription, doesn't cover that surgery. And here's the thing, they're just doing their job. And so here Paul, he's a prisoner, he's faced with possible execution. And here's what I want you to realize. When that happens, don't take it personally. And then, here's another thing that Paul had to deal with, the shipwreck. So when daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground. But the ship struck a sandbar and the bow stuck fast and would not move and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. So they see this land and they're like, man, man, maybe we can make it to land. Well, they don't make it to land. There's this sandbar that the boat gets stuck on. And as a result, the waves now are probably huge and they're capsizing the boat, hitting the boat and, they're, and the boat is being torn to pieces. And so now word is being sent out all across the ship. Hey, you got to get ready to go overboard. And so now if you can swim, go ahead and jump overboard. If you can't, if you can't, won't you wait just a few moments? And then once some wood is in the water, jump in the water, grab on a piece of wood and in some sense float or try to kick your way to Safety. Now, again, I want you to think this is a this is like very dramatic. Could you imagine watching a movie or could you imagine watching a play where all of this is taking place within about a month? You got sea and seasons and sea captains and storms and soldiers. And now you got to jump ship and you got to swim to shore. And so they they get to land, but they had to abandon ship. Let me ask you. What have you had to abandon because it was just too dangerous to stay in? Maybe some of you, you've faced a shipwreck of a marriage. Maybe you faced a shipwreck of a toxic relationship. Maybe you faced a shipwreck of a job or a career or a vocation. It was just too toxic, too dangerous. It was unhealthy for you to stay in. Maybe you have faced a shipwreck of faith because your faith was very light. There was, no, there was no substance to your faith and so you had a shipwreck of faith and you had to abandon, you had to jump out of the faith that you were in and in search of another more solid, substantial faith. So Paul is facing a shipwreck just as all of the people are. And they land on Malta. So just so that you know, uh, here's, here's some 
photos of present day Malta. So a couple of years ago, Joni and I on a Mediterranean cruise, we visited Malta. And so this is the landscape there. And then, you know, here's a picture of the city, just a very nice little city. Now this didn't exist back then. And, and then even this church. So we, we found this church and I had to take a picture of it. St. Paul's Shipwreck Church. And so th this is present day Malta, very beautiful, beautiful island. That's where they find themselves on. And then as they have made it to the shore safely, here's the next thing that we see, snake bites. So they built the fire. So the islanders showed us unusual kindness. It, by what Luke is writing, they are not Greek. They are what Luke would call barbarians because they didn't speak the Greek language. So anybody who didn't speak the Greek language, they were referred to as barbarians. So that's what he means by islanders. And they showed them kindness and they built a fire because it was raining and cold. And here's what happened. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself on his hands. Now you can't make this stuff up. Like I'm reading this and I've read this passage many a times, but as I'm preparing this message, I'm like going, really? You have sea and seasons that are very difficult. You have sea captains that won't listen to you. You have storms that you have no control over that batter you and bruise you. You have soldiers that want to kill you and they're just doing their job. You have to, you have to abandon ship. You got to swim to shore. You get to shore safely. You build a fire. You're all warmed by that fire and then a snake bites you. You've all been there. And if you haven't, you'll, you will. Because that's when you say, when, when it rains, it, it's pouring. I feel bad for Paul. But I, but I know that some of you, you understand what's going on because you feel that way. You felt that way. You're like, what else can happen? And just so that you know about snake bites, Paul didn't see that one coming. It's what we would call a freak accident. See, you weren't planning on that accident. You, you weren't planning on that diagnosis. You, you weren't planning on having to repair that car. You weren't planning on that flood that the hurricane brought. You weren't planning on losing that loved one at that stage in life. You weren't planning on your husband cheating on you. You weren't planning on it. And it's just like pouring now in your life. And here's the question. Because I, I, again, if you haven't been there, just wait. But here's the question though. When you're there, like Paul was, how do you respond to all of these elements? How, how, how do you live life knowing that you have faced all of the, you are facing all of these elements? Well, let's look at what he does. Here's the list. And I say responses we should give. And the reason why I say we should give is because I know that I don't give all of these responses all of the time. This is where I'm challenged. Pastor Josh is challenged by the faith in action of the Apostle Paul. I pray that we all would be challenged because here's what we see. Endure, share your experience, patiently love, share God's word, have unwavering trust, swim, serve through it, and then you're gonna shake it off. So let's go through each of those individually. So we're going to endure and share our experience. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the day of atonement. So it's around September, October. So Paul warned them, man, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives as well. So here you have... Paul, he's enduring the season. And as he's enduring the season and as he's seeing the writing on the wall, he shares his experience that, hey, this is going to be disastrous if we do, if we do not anchor somewhere for the winter. Now, how can Paul share that? Like, does he have a background in this? Actually, he does. If you read his second letter to the Corinthians, you're going to find that he had been shipwrecked. Anybody know how many times? Three times. So he, he knows the conditions. He knows the situation. He's been there before and he's 
and he shares his wisdom. He shares his understanding. He shares his experience. Notice that he doesn't scold them. He doesn't call them names. He doesn't shame them. He simply shares with them. Like when it comes to our life in the midst of a storm or difficult season or even these sea captains that don't want to listen, they're hard-headed. Hey, listen, we're just simply called to share. That, that's what we're called. We, we can't force them. You can't force your child to, to listen and obey. You can't force your boss to listen and obey, but you can simply share your wisdom and your understanding that God has given you. And that's what Paul does. He simply shares as he's enduring the season. But then here's a, another thing that we see in terms of response. Pa- patiently loves, shares God's word, and has unwavering trust. So Paul stood up before them and said, uh, uh, this is when they realized that they've made a mistake. And Paul just simply says, uh, men, you should have taken my advice. But I still love you though, brother. Because he said, then you would have spared yourselves in, in this damage and loss. But here's what he's going to do. He's going to encourage them. I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. So Paul has this patience, this loving patience towards people that disregarded him. And he's even encouraging them that not one of them will be lost, that everyone will be saved, although the ship, eh, we're going to lose the ship. But could you, I mean, could you imagine like, cause I'd be a little ticked off. Now he, again, he does say, Hey, uh, you should listen to me, but nevertheless, I love you, brother. Hey, you're going to be saved. We're going to get out of this. I, I promise you. Now, how did he know that? Well, let's look last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And here's what my God said. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. He just simply shares with them what God had told him. So yes, he is sharing his experience and his understanding and wisdom. They're ignoring him. But now when they can no longer ignore, he's like, hey, listen, Let let me give you something else. Let me share with you what God has revealed to me. And it is a gracious word. It is a good word. It is a merciful word. Hey, listen, when we go through seasons of difficulty, when we go through storms of life, when we deal with sea captains that will not listen to us, when we deal with the world that that, that thinks that we're aloof, that we don't know what we're talking about, but then something happens in their life and a crisis happens in their life and they're looking for answers, that is when we step into the gap and we begin to share what the word, what God has revealed to us. And I want people to know, I want the church to know that when we share with the world, when they are in crisis, it should be a good and gracious word, even in the midst of disaster. And that's what he's doing. And and then there's this unwavering trust. The soldiers plan to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. And I'm I'm sure words started to circulate with the prisoners on the boat. Well, guess we're done, Jethro. But Paul's not worried. Why? Because he has this unwavering trust in the Lord. Let me ask you, do you have this unwavering trust in the Lord? Yes, it doesn't look good. Yes, it's dark. You're battered. You're bruised. I get it. But do you have unwavering trust in the Lord? And then here's another thing that we see of how He's going to respond by serving, swimming, and serving through it. This is how he's going to respond to the the storms. This is how he's going to respond to the shipwreck and the potential that is right before him of this ship about to wreck. So just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. And here's what he said. For the last 14 days, you've been in constant suspense and have gone without food. And you've not eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. 
This is where I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get us to put ourselves in the Apostle Paul's shoes. You're going through all of this, yet you take the time to notice the condition of other people on the ship. And to serve them saying, it is not good that you have not eaten anything for 14 days. You need your strength. We're about to abandon ship. You're going to need some energy to swim. And I care enough for you to enter into your condition and to share with you what you need. And this again, where I'm challenged because I've been in these storms. I've been in these difficult situations and my eyes have not been on other people. Because guess where my eyes have been fixated? This guy. But yet, Paul's gonna serve through the shipwreck, through the storm. And then we actually see that the centurion ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. And this way, everyone reached land safely. All right, now, some of you, you're, 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 you're not gonna wanna hear this, but how do you need to respond to the shipwreck? Yes, you need to serve, but you also just need to swim through it. And some of you, you you're in a tough situation, and you just wanna give up. No, 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 no. Swim through it. Swim through it. I know you're tired. I know you're mentally, physically, spiritually exhausted. But you need to swim through it. I mean, Paul, could you, I mean, he had to swim through it. He had to jump overboard. He had to swim. Having, having spent the, the last month or so on the seas like that, battered, bruised, you know, probably lack of sleep, malnourished to some degree. He's got to jump overboard and he's got to swim to shore. You just got to swim through it. But then, here's what we see once he gets to land. You know, so they're gonna build a fire, but look at what Paul's doing. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and he's gonna put it on the fire. I'm like thinking to myself, does this man ever slow down? This man seems to serve nonstop. Like Paul, you made it to land safely. Won't you let some other people? There's 275 other people that can bring some brushwood. You got a whole island of people now helping you out. You can sit still. He can't. Why? Because it is in now his DNA because he has the righteousness of Christ in him that he has to live out this life through him. And this life of Christ in us is one that serves and swims and serves through the difficulties of life. Now, let me go back to the whole idea of sinking and serving. Do you know why Paul could serve even when he was sinking? Now, Paul could serve when he was sinking because he knew that he wouldn't go down because Jesus wasn't done. Now, I know that we might not have the promise that God gave to Paul that he would testify in Rome. But see, Paul's, he's holding on to that. So he knew that even though the ship was sinking, he wasn't going to go down because God wasn't done. Listen, I want us to realize that God has numbered our days. When we're done, we're done. So we can hold to the anchor of our faith and know that he's not gonna let anything happen to us until he's done. But here's another thing. You remember when Jesus was on the the sea, he's walking along the the, the sea. Well, no, he's not walking along the sea. There was a time where he was walking along the sea, but he's in the boat this time and he's fast asleep and there's a storm that comes up on the boat. And the disciples are freaking out. And he calms the storm. And here's what I want us to know even today. Is that even though the ship might go down, if we are in Jesus, we will always come up. Because we serve a risen king. Here's another 
response, he's going to just shake it off. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood. And then as he put the brushwood on this viper driven out by the heat, fastened itself on on his hand. Now the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand and here's what they say. Well, this guy must be a murderer and he's getting justice. Like he escaped the sea, but he got to land and justice came and got him and this viper attacked him. But look at what Paul, Paul does. He shook the snake off in the fire. I love that. Just get off me, snake, get off. Now I'd be freaking out. I hate snakes. He just, he just shakes it off. So he's going to swim through it. He <laughs> gets, gets to land and a viper bites him and he just shakes it off. You know, you can shake off that accident. You can shake off the betrayal. You can shake off the diagnosis. You can shake off the lost. You can shake off the shame the regret, the guilt, you can, you can shake it off. Now, I'm not telling you to shake off the pain. That pain's real. You don't think that hurt? But what, what we're telling you to shake off is shake off the attachment. You ain't gotta live with that shame anymore. You ain't gotta live with them identifying you as this. You can shake that off in Jesus' name. And you can move forward refusing to let the snake bite stop you. He shakes it off. And so I think some of you, you need to shake off some things this morning. And then here's what we're going to see next. Now remember, your life is the stage for your faith to be on display. We're all gonna face these elements. Here's the responses that believers actually should give and these are the outcomes that we might experience if we respond this way. So do you see this list? Peace, favor, protection, provision, miracles in and through you and impart life. Let me go through those really quick and just show you what happens. So how can Paul have peace? Well, it's from Acts 23, because God told him to take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify about me in Rome. Peace is in the promise. Peace is in the promise. Peace is in the promise. All right, now you gotta come in for this one. I wrote this down this morning as I was praying through this message. There are times God will not bring peace to the storm, but he will give you peace through the storm. See, see, there, there are times where God, yes, he can stop the storm, and he has. But there are times where God's gonna give you peace through the storm, which is what he's doing with Paul. He gave him a promise to get him through the storm. And let me ask you this, do you have a promise? Do you have some promises that get you through these storms? Because here's the thing, if you and I do not have any promises to cling to through the storm, then you're clinging to despair. And if you have despair, nothing to cling to, that despair turns to depression. And you wonder why there are so many people in our culture today, they are having some kind of form of depression because they have despair, because they have no promise to cling to. But the church has a promise to cling to that will never sink us that will get us through the storms y'all all right preaching now just a little bit on mother's day happy mother's day because some of you moms you know this some of you christian moms you know this some of you christian moms you've been through this and the only thing that you had was the promises of your god to get you through that And so Paul had peace. That was an outcome because he had a promise. But then here's another outcome is favor. Oh, I love this one. So in an attempt to escape from the ship, here, the captain and the sailors let the lifeboat down and they're pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. But know what they're really doing is like, we got to abandon ship. So let's get the lifeboat. Let's let the lifeboat down. We'll go overboard, get into the lifeboat and we'll leave, we'll leave these people by themselves to die. But Paul said to the centurion who was overseeing the boat, 
He said, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Who's in charge of the boat now? (laughs) Paul is. Prisoner Paul is now in charge of the boat. Why? Because he ultimately knows the captain over the boat. (laughs) And they're looking to him. But here's another thing that we see. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. They were all encouraged and they ate some food themselves. Look, look, Look who's in charge. Look at who they're listening to now. Okay, church, you, you need to know this. this I'm telling you, I, I think this is gonna set some of you free today. A firm faith opens up the doors of favor. So these people were not listening to Paul a couple of weeks ago. Now they're listening to Paul. Why? Because of the firmness of his faith. Just think about it. As they're going through this difficult moment, as they're going through this difficult season, they are seeing a man who shares, who serves, who swims, who endures, who shares what God has told them, who says encouraging words. I mean, like they are listening to this man that has this outpouring of this deep, substantial faith. This is actually what we need in America right now. The church has lost favor in the culture. We have been pushed to the periphery. And there are some Christians, they want to fight like hell to get it back. That's not how you get favor in God's kingdom. You get favor through the firmness and the steadfastness and the faithfulness of your faith. Not through trying to force people to buy into what you're selling. And see, if you study actually church history, even if you study Old Testament history when they were in exile, how did they gain favor in those pagan nations? Through the faithfulness of their faith. And when you study the first three centuries of church history, the reason why the church garnered so much power and favor in the fourth, fifth, and sixth century and beyond was because of their faithfulness demonstrating the faith of Jesus. And see, if we really want to get favor again, we ought to be faithful to the Lord and he will open up the doors of favor. Protection and provision. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and and kept them from carrying out their plan. And God's protecting Paul. Once safely on shore, we found out the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They even built a fire and welcomed us all. Do you you see the protection? Do you see the provision? And here's another thing that we see. They honored us in many ways. And when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with supplies we needed. And this took place over three months. And then they're going to let us set sail. Do, Do you see how God is in the process of providing and protecting Paul, I mean, I could sit here and testify, and I know that many of you could as well, just how God has provided for you over and over and over, how he has protected you over and over and over. But then what what were the outcomes of the snake bite and their presence on the island? Well, 276 people's lives were spared because of Paul. Could you imagine what it would have looked like if Paul wasn't on that ship? And then he shook off the snake and he suffered no ill effects. And then you know what else happened on that island? Here's another thing that happened on that island. So you had Publius, who was the leader of the island. His father was sick, suffering from from fever and dysentery. Paul went to see him and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. I mean, this is amazing that God is going to work through Paul's responses, work through his faith to bring about miracles of healing and life. So here's here's the takeaways and and I'm done. Here's the takeaways. And again, I'm just going to give them to you so, so that you can chew on them. 
The stage isn't easy, but your faith can be firm. Hey, life's not easy. The play's not easy. The theater is not easy. You and I will face a lot of trying, difficult elements, but our faith can be firm. The outcomes of the stage are tied to the obedience of your faith. If you actually, if you actually want to know why you are experiencing what you are experiencing in terms of the outcomes, I'm telling you, it's just an embodiment of the investment of your faith. See, the reason why Paul is seeing the outcomes he's seeing is because of the faith he was producing. Number three, you might be bitten, but your faith doesn't have to be shaken. Some of you've been bitten, but you ain't got to be shaken. Number four, God can salvage shipwrecks and displace signs of salvation. This may probably be my most favorite one is because there are a lot of shipwrecks that happen in our life. But praise God, praise God, he specializes in salvaging shipwrecks. And then number five, the end of the play will always end in death, but you can live to bring life. Let me ask you this, are you living to bring life? Are you living to bring life? Hey, will you stand with me? We'll give the prayer of benediction and pray that you have a wonderful weekend. But I, want, I, want, I, I hope and pray that you're challenged by this message. I hope and pray that maybe for some of you, you will check your faith. And then for some of you, you might wanna change your faith and actually put it in Jesus and not yourself. So will you just receive this benediction? Father, we, we surrender our life to you. That you truly are the captain of creation. You're the captain of our life and every sphere of our life. And I know that you are sovereign over creation and there are times where Events just happen because of the natural ebb and flow of living in a fallen world and being surrounded by falling people. But Spirit of God, I pray that you will fill us, empower us to live out this kind of faith that is demonstrated in the Apostle Paul. Because we pray for those outcomes. Because we know those outcomes are really some of the most powerful messages and sermons we could preach of peace and favor of miracles and life being imparted to those who are sick so father may you be glorified in and through us in this world all God's people said you are sent out to be the salt and light of the earth.